Well, good morning, Greenwich, and welcome to the Monday, April 15th. Yes, it's tax day edition of the Basement Academy. For those who are watching, you can obviously see that I have a green checkered shirt on. Green for the Masters uh, that concluded yesterday with Scotty Scheffler winning. Love watching that. And then green for the money you're going to get back right? You're going to get back money on your tax refund. <laughs> so uh, thanks for taking a few minutes out of your day as we continue on with some reflections on the denominational realignment process, reflections on realignment and other thoughts on church life. And so I want to read a morning psalm, Psalm 15, and then I want to dive in. And so Psalm 15 simply says it's a psalm of David. Lord, who may dwell in your sanctuary? Who may live on your holy hill? He whose walk is blameless and who does what is righteous, who speaks the truth from his heart and has no slander on his tongue, who does his neighbor no wrong and casts no slur on his fellow man who despises a vile man, but honors those who fear the Lord, who keeps his oath even when it hurts, who lends his money without usury and does not accept a bribe against the innocent. He who does these things will never be shaken. Amen. Psalm 15. <clears throat> we were talking about how yesterday in, in uh, the Sunday morning message at Greenwich, how Jesus fulfills the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. This would be a Psalm that Jesus alone fulfills. He alone is worthy and able to enter the sanctuary, uh, stand on God's holy hill, his perfect sinless life. So we rejoice in the goodness of Jesus and Lord, live your life in us. Okay. Uh, last week began uh, a series of reflections, kind of pastoral observations over the last several years. Timeline, um, reasons that we're considering this denominational realignment that is moving out of the Peace USA. Um, we are meeting uh, in two weeks, uh, less than two weeks now, on uh, April 28th. Uh, the discernment team from our presbytery is coming out. You're invited to join. It'd be really important for you to be there. You may not want to speak. You may not speak at all. Important that you're there to listen, but more important that you show up to demonstrate to our team that you take this matter seriously. Okay, so I'd love to, to see you on the 28th. What I'd like to do this week, instead of a series of broad reflections and context setting things like I did last week, what I want to do this week is kind of narrow the focus. Back in the summer of 2022, when we were beginning this conversation informally with our Presbytery leadership and within the uh, con congregation, we had held some forums. I, I took a, a summer study leave for four weeks and I uh, engaged in a, a, a true study. I, I produced a study guide for Greenwich. It's so long ago that you've mostly forgotten about it. And then I did 40 Basement Academy episodes um, based on that study guide. What I wanna do this week is do some highlights, high level work around that. Now, I've asked Joy to post a PDF of the study guide. The total thing is 16 pages. It's a, a cover page and then 15 one page studies. And so, um, I'm also going through this on the Sunday morning pastor's class, and so we're making our way slowly through that. But knowing a lot of folks aren't going to that class, and a lot of folks maybe never watched or forgot uh, the studies from 2022, I thought it would be important to highlight a, a few of the studies, a few of the themes that I tease out in this study guide that I, th I think are very important. And so the first couple, it's broken into four sections, taking the light yoke of Jesus, thinking about this realignment process as a discipleship endeavor. You've heard that theme last week. 
the second part, what are denominations? Just let's get our head clear about what a denomination is in general, let alone what the PC USA speaks or teaches in specific, right? And then the third part is Greenwich's case for realignment. And then the fourth part are some tools, how to contend for the truth with grace. Because see, that's the key, truth and grace uh, together, so hard. And so the first couple studies um, are, are trying to engage the understanding around discipleship, what discipleship is. We're called to discipleship, to be followers, students of Jesus. And I frame it as apprenticeship. The best way of understanding it is to think of an apprentice in the trades. So you, you go and you are learning a, a skill, a set of skills from the master. We are learning from the master Jesus, the skills of living, the skills of loving, the skills of forgiving, the skills of obedience, the skills of relationship, the skills of learning how to stay in relationship even when we have differences with fellow Christians. And so I talk about the workshop of disagreement, that there's something that happens to the apprentice We go to the workshop to actually learn the craft, right? And it seems as if God has ordained disagreement as a means by which his people learn to be humble, learn to listen, learn to forbear, learn to forgive, learn to follow Jesus, okay? And so that, that's just the, the first two studies. Uh, hopefully you'll look at those. But I wanna, I wanna today just give a high-level summary of the third study uh, what is called a danger crouching at the door. So the context for this whole study guide is there are some differences and disagreements that, that the leadership of Greenwich has, and I believe many of the members as well, but the leadership, pastors and elders, have some theological disagreements with the uh, the stances of the Presbyterian Church USA. Went through some of those last week. So what do we do with those disagreements? And so there is a danger that crouches at the door. Now that phrase comes from Genesis chapter four, the Cain and Abel story. And so let me read that just so you, you hear the story again. Adam lay with his wife Eve and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. Later, she gave birth to his brother, Abel. Now, Abel kept flocks and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. But Abel brought fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry and his face was downcast. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you, oops, just what to, <laughs> One, one too many pages. But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must master it. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out to the field. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is your brother Abel? I don't know, he replied. Am I my brother's keeper? The Lord said, What have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you are under a curse and driven from the ground, which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it will no longer yield its crops for you. You will be a restless wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is more than I can bear. Today you are driving me from the land and I will be hidden from your presence. I will be a restless wanderer on the earth and whoever finds me will kill me. But the Lord said to him, Not so. 
If anyone kills Cain, he will suffer vengeance seven times over. Then the Lord put a mark on Cain so that no one who found him would kill him. So Cain went out from the Lord's presence and lived in the land of Nod, east of Eden. There, there's a little more after that, but we'll stop there. And so the danger that crouches at the door hearkens to the Cain and Abel story. What Cain does is he turns his brother into an enemy. He turns his brother Abel, his younger brother, whom he is called to be the keeper of, right? Older siblings often are instructed that way by their parents. Hey, you, need, you watch your little brother, your little sister. I'm going to go over here to the kitchen and I'll come back. And so the older sibling has responsibilities to keep and to watch over and make sure the younger siblings are protected. We don't know if that instruction happened from Adam and Eve, but Cain had the idea somehow, what, am I my brother's keeper? Hmm. Looks like you kind of know you are, right? <laughs> And so to, to take this story as a backdrop and now, now come forward to our experience, our context of a denominational disagreement. Again, we don't know all of what went on between Cain and Abel, but Cain turned his brother into an enemy and took things into his own hand and destroyed his enemy. And God warned him, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to master you. But if you do what is right, you'll be accepted, okay? And so my concern around this kind of work that we're doing, this conversation about realignment, my concern is that there is a danger crouching at the door. As I shared last week um, with some hopefully sober and appropriate pastoral um, confidence and reflection, I have been concerned about some of the language and some of the attitudes that I perceive from folks at Greenwich towards the members of the Presbyterian Church USA, particularly members of the Presbytery, whom are, are, are not known to individuals at Greenwich. So out of people's mouths are coming, is coming language and, and a, an attitude that I perceive that is negative or pejorative towards our presbytery members. Now, I have relationship with these people and I spoke to that last week. And so the danger that crouches at the door is we take fellow Christians, sisters and brothers in Christ, who have professed faith in Jesus, who have taken ordination vows, like many have at Greenwich, not all, but many. And these are professing Christians who are committed to the scriptures, committed to worship, committed to reaching the lost, committed to the work of the church, and who may interpret scripture differently in some or several places. I'm not denying that there are differences, but see, it is those differences that leads to the danger crouching at the door. There's something in us that takes the disagreement with another person and even if that other person is not even known to you, right? It's just a kind of a, an institution. We talked about that last week. I've got real relationships with people, and so I'm very sympathetic. I, you know, there are differences by all means, but we understand we're colleagues and we're fellow uh, uh, brothers and sisters in Christ. But the danger is you don't know folks, and you know they differ, and there's sometimes a dismissive attitude. And I do this too. So I forgive me for like feeling like I'm pointing the finger at you, the listener at Greenwich. I do the, the danger crouches at, at my door and it crouches at the door that I would have differences with folks at Greenwich who maybe speak of my friends in a way that I don't appreciate. Right. And so all of a sudden I want to turn my Greenwich sister or brother into an enemy in my mind. That's the danger that we turn brothers and others into enemies. All the folks in the Peace USA that we are going to be in conversation with are fellow Christians. They love Jesus. They love the scriptures. They love the church. Frankly, many of them have expressed a love for us, an affection 
for me and Eric as pastors and Greenwich by extension as a church family. And so my concern is that we would not fall prey to what Cain did, that we would we would do what is right and be accepted. We would be aware, we would be warned by the, 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 the Cain story, the Cain and Abel story, and that we would not uh, turn our disagreement into some kind of moral crusade where we have to demonstrate a victory, a verbal victory or some other kind of victory over our uh, sisters and brothers in Christ. But this is what we humans do. There's a tendency within us, I believe it comes from sin. In the study guide, I go a little deeper into this. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil infects us with a tendency to think that we're always right. We take that capacity of moral judgment that God has granted us, and then we endow ourselves with superior moral knowledge. We think, that is every individual thinks I'm right. And if I'm right, and you don't agree with me, then you must be wrong. And so the tendency then is to demonize the other person with whom we disagree. And we turn things into an us, a me versus you, an us versus them. We form uh, what are sometimes called moral tribes or ideological tribes. And so when we talk about progressives and conservatives, we, we're starting to you know, move towards tribal language as if there was some kind of boundary around these folks and boundary around those folks. And, and then all of a sudden, the tribes now fight each other. Instead of find ways to cooperate and understand we agree on a whole lot of stuff, we tend to focus, excuse me, focus on the differences. And so this tendency to demonize the other is the danger crouching at the door. And the tendency then to kind of smugly act upon that or, or in some way, um, um, I, I put this on the outline, we, we, we begin to feel a sense of moral superiority. I interpret the scripture right. They interpret the scripture wrong. They don't believe the Bible at all. And, and I, I actually had a conversation yesterday with somebody after my pastor's class where this was exactly what happened came up and we need to tell those people and they're wrong and they've departed and they've got, there's no right, you know, and I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. now these are our sisters and brothers. These are our sisters and brothers. And so we do it so quickly, we don't even detect it. That's, that's the danger. We slip into the attitude and mode of Cain so quickly, we never notice it. And so the feelings of moral superiority that our my particular or our particular interpretation of scripture is the right interpretation. I don't think it's wrong to approach the scriptures and we should pursue truth, right? We should pursue righteousness, but we do so with a humility. We don't hold the truth um, with hubris and pride and haughtiness. We do so with humility. God is so gracious to reveal to us the scriptures, right? And so what happens is the feelings of moral superiority, this feeling of righteous, then in our minds, in, we become righteous because we feel superior and we feel right. It's as if we are right. See, Cain felt some moral superiority, some kind of righteousness over and against Abel. And it, he justified destroying Abel in some moral framework that he had erected. And then he, he um, I don't know if abdicated is the right word, but he excused himself. I have no responsibility for him. Am I my brother's keeper? He's his own man. And God held him accountable. That was the danger crouching at the door. And so I just want to uh, uh, affirm and, and speak clearly. Feeling righteous is not necessarily righteousness. The Pharisees felt righteous when they were confronting Jesus for healing on the Sabbath. The Pharisees felt righteous when they were confronting Jesus about his um, association with 
the riffraff, the tax collectors and sinners. Uh, the, the, the Pharisees and Sadducees felt righteous when they uh, were arresting, having Jesus arrested and, and, and trying him uh, in, in the trial before his crucifixion. The, the, the Pharisees felt righteous when they stirred up the crowd and said, crucify him, crucify him. Just because one feels righteous and, and that sense of moral superiority does not mean we are righteous. And that's part of the danger as well. So anyway, I think, I think I'll wrap up there. Um, so, so hear this as kind of a pastoral word of warning that as we proceed through this conversation with each other and with the presbytery, let us be attentive to the danger that is at the door and let us conduct ourselves with humility, with wisdom, with openness, with kindness and grace towards our sisters and brothers who will be visiting us from the presbytery. And, and we're gonna talk how to work through differences and the importance of differences, but I wanted to start with the warning about the danger crouching at the door. Listen to how you talk and then listen to how others speak through this conversation. And if you hear somebody maybe leaning in that direction of Cain, pray for them. Don't necessarily go confront them and turn it into a squabble. Pray for them at that moment. Pray that God would help them to see that there's a better way, a more excellent way, the way of love, okay? Let's, let's close with prayer. And so, Father, we thank you for the scriptures given to us that point us to the redemption and the righteousness that comes through Christ, not through our own feelings of superiority. And so, Jesus, help us to see out of this story with Cain and Abel the danger that crouches at our door as we walk through this conversation. And so keep us, guard us, protect us uh, from the schemes of the devil and our own foolishness and sinful flesh. Lord, protect us as we pray in your holy name, even as you taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. May God guard you guard your heart and mind through Christ Jesus. May God keep you from the temptations and schemes of the devil. And may God bless you with a generous and gracious heart toward every neighbor you have, especially those that you may disagree with. May he do it this day and forevermore. Amen.